Um, I'm going to be talking about courage this morning, but and, and specifically about a, a, a virtue ethic of courage in, in, in the context of um, environmental ethics. Um, but I think I need to say that I'm not an ethicist. Uh, last year, I had the opportunity to study under a wonderful ethics scholar, Nick Austin. And so these are some of my thoughts stemming from some of the research and thinking I did under him. Uh, but I don't take credit for it. It's built on the thinking of lots of people who've written about virtue ethics and the ethic of courage in particular. Oh. Probably fair to say that any errors in the thinking are, of course, mine. Um, can I just make sure that everyone is uh, muted partly because if you're not muted, you will be on the recording. Um, so make us courageous to embrace the changes that are needed in search of the common good. That intercession is in the prayer for the fifth anniversary of Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si. Um, I think we have forgotten to put on the subtitles, so yeah, they're on now. Thank you. Let, let me just um, say that again then, because I think it's a really important sentence. Make us courageous to embrace the changes that are needed in search of the common good. And embracing the changes that are needed to address the climate and ecological crisis is key to finding this common good. And so it seems to me that it's important to consider what this environmental ethic of courage might look like. And I'm going to suggest to you this morning that the traditional idea of courage, bravery, is useful, but it isn't really a sufficient understanding of what the ethic of courage needs to be in the contemporary context. But first I want to ask, why do we need an ethic of courage in an environmental context? I think it's fair to say that courage is integral to the performance of pretty much all our other ethical values. Anyone striving for what's good will always meet up with difficulties. And it's courage that steps up to meet those difficulties. If we lack courage, then all the care, compassion, humility, respect, love that we feel for the natural world and for humanity within it will simply be ineffective attitudes. I think we need courage to be good people and to live well. And I think there are other obvious benefits. If we make courageous environmental choices, we can make sometimes small, but we can make a concrete difference. For instance, if we uh, have the courage to renounce our habits of consumption, even though they make our lives much more comfortable and pleasurable, then this will create less carbon emissions and reduce our contribution to environmental degradation, say. Secondly, by engaging in courageous environmental activism, there's the potential that we can engage the moral conscience of decision makers. So that's another uh, benefit. And we can also encourage other people to act environmentally courageously by our example. I read somewhere recently, I can't remember where now, uh, that it's almost impossible to imagine a society in which courageous actions are not highly regarded. But when I read it, I did wonder about the importance for us, not only to display courage, but to mod model the, the type of courage that we might want to see in others. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. But I think it's also worth noting at this point that if we can be courageous in acting in accordance with our attitudes and our values, there is a very real benefit for ourselves too, an internal benefit. Courage is connected with integrity in that when we don't engage our courage mode, we aren't really able to, or we don't act on our convictions. And there's a sense of becoming alienated from ourselves. 
we need to resolve the tension between our expressed attitudes and our inaction that internal dissonance between being aware of what's virtuous and good but not living it out and as we often experience that's quite a harmful personal dynamic but by finding our courage we can start healing this divide and we can begin to promote that personal flourishing that god wants to to see in us that god wants for us because god loves us i don't think god wants us to feel bad about ourselves so i hope that kind of helps set a context for why courage is important um, as we move on to look at what courage looks like what, what is the courage that we might want to model As a starting point, I thought it might be helpful to look briefly at the account of courage proposed by Aristotle and then built upon by Thomas Aquinas. Now, Aristotle and Aquinas both develop accounts of courage primarily in relation to the risk of bodily suffering and death. Aristotle's was in the context of the battlefield and Aquinas in the context of martyrdom. And modern ethicists identify, particularly in Aristotle's account, some pretty problem, problematic things. Um, it's militaristic, it's androcentric, uh, focused on men in its nature. But I think there are some useful notions to take with us. Aristotle acknowledges the need for courage to be in pursuit of a moral good. I think here we probably all agree that in addressing the climate and ecological crisis there is that moral good but a question that i think we have to ask ourselves is where that moral good might stop where for instance might moral good tip into eco-fascism or eco-terrorism and i think that's an important balance that we have to find Aristotle also says that courage must be in balance between an excessive bravery, that's recklessness, and an overabundance of fearfulness or caution. So it's necessary, I think, for us to consider that as well as a detrimental lack of action resulting from a lack of courage, there is a corresponding harm at the other end of the spectrum of, of rash and dangerous action. And the courageous will discern a proper balance between these two harms. Aquinas drew upon Aristotle to develop a specifically Christian virtue of courage, and he brings into focus the characteristics of perseverance and endurance. Aquinas proposes that Christians are required patiently to persevere in the face of persecution because they have the confidence that enduring such wrong is a gift of love and without perseverance in our modern context we might simply give up i think we need to recognize that perseverance is that gift of love courage seems to me in the modern context precisely to involve situations in which we recognize that we might not succeed in reaching our goal but we continue i think that other good takeaways from aquinas are that courage and justice are at one i think it's important to recognize the concept of justice when we exercise our moral courage and Aquinas also says that in order not to do wrong, courage requires that we're able to suffer and endure wrong to ourselves. And I think there's a really important something that we can learn from that. I think um, the unjustness of our prosecutions, the unjustness of our being sent to prison falls into that sort of category but i want to say that i don't think aquinas's account of courage is sufficient for what we need i think this is partly because it's rooted in physical bravery and we need more we need moral courage but also because it focuses on individual on on, on the act of courage and perhaps a bit less about how we live courageously <clears throat> 
So I'm going to look at moral courage, which I think is connected with this idea of living courageously and the rest of what I'm going to say. Moral courage, moral, it, it, courage in the moral sense is about being honorable and fearless. Although fear is present, it's about doing the right things for the right reasons. But moral courage is, is situationally broad, it's context driven and it's layered and it's difficult and it may even be impossible to define comprehensively. And I think we need to look at it in every situation that we find ourselves in. But one suggestion that might help is that we can pin it down somewhat as the capacity to overcome the fear of shame and humiliation in order to do four things. One is to confess a wrong. Two is to reject evil conformity. Three is to denounce injustice. And four is to defy immoral imperatives. So environmental courage might mean accepting our past complicity in engendering the current crisis. It might mean speaking out about it. It means refusing to continue to partake in the current system of harmful consumption and maybe advocating for a just transition to a better system. And it probably means refusing to comply with the societal demands and statutory demands that we acquiesce in the status quo. So I think that's a really useful checklist. But I do think we need more. How do we live courageous and faithful, God-centered lives in our complex landscape of environmental activism? So I thought it might be useful to look at what types of courage might provide templates for that. Well, first, I think there is a mundane, persistent, everyday courage, the refusal to despair even in the worst of all possible situations. And I think for that, we can look to the courage of people who lived uh, and live hopeful, loving, connected and generous lives in hostile regimes and under daily oppressions. And I don't think I need to take you through the number of examples there are of that, but just to hold that in your mind. And secondly, there's the courage of those who have advocated for peace and who continue daily to advocate for peace. Looking at their resisting the weight of public opinion and the constant societal appeal to patriotism and duty, the sort of moral and social isolation that they've endured in being involved in an unpopular cause and their persistence. And again, I'm not going to go into specific examples. You can look them up yourselves and we don't have time really to go through all of those. But just to think that there is that model there for us. And third, I want to look, and possibly in a little bit more detail, in the model of caregiver courage, where the needs of others supersede self-interests, which involves a refusal of self-assertion and the willingness to put one's own projects and goals on hold for the sake of other people. It's a courage that's often to be found working within community. And this is the courage that a feminist lens points up as female courage, often the idea of motherly courage in place of a traditional masculine model of the brave hero. But I don't think it's limited to women. I think we can find it in all people if we tap into that tradition of courage as opposed to the tradition of the uh, battlefield hero. But I just want to sound a note of caution when we kind of hold that model in our in our minds and try and Im maybe embed that in our lives. There is the potential that this particular model of moral courage that involves sacrifice and the refusal of self-assertion, particularly when identified, I think, with historical womanly courage, might devolve into an oppression. The risk is that this concept can be shaped, for instance, through cultural expectations to be self-sacrificing to the point of negating any sense of individual flourishing. 
And I think that God loves us and doesn't want that. God wants us to flourish as, as people. And that oppression is a barrier to that flourishing. So I think the most satisfactory way in which we can defend against this is they're calling love into play. Love in this circumstance is a form of self-love rooted in God's love for us. And I think it's key to safeguarding against the risk of oppression because that sense, that proper self-love, that sense of being loved by God will help us to find balance. So I think those are just some of the models that might be helpful. You might have other models that you can look to in your own life. But something that pervades each of these models and kind of extends what we took from Aquinas is endurance, both in the sense of bearing hardship and in the sense of staying power. I think moral courage is a daily necessity. And I think it's noteworthy that key to all those three models of courage that I've put forward is not their grand heroic acts, but their embedded way of living. So I'd like to briefly, I'm keeping an eye on the time here, I'd like to briefly consider further the notions of love and hope, which I think are very relevant to the concept of moral courage, especially when we consider it as an environmental virtue. Uh, actions of sacrifice need to be resourced by something other than courage itself. Aristotle saw that courage alone of all the virtues doesn't really generate pleasure. He regarded virtues as being difficult and arduous to acquire, but once achieved, they became a source of pleasure and they become a source of pleasure. The generous person enjoys being generous and the temperate person enjoys moderation. But it doesn't really make sense to say that courage is enjoyed in the same way because courage, whether it's moral or physical, is generally not in and of itself a, a motivator because it's, it's actually just an ability to step up to something that we fear, something that we don't want to do in pursuit of the greater good. So it works in a different way. And it needs something to resource it. And love, whether love of yourself or love of other, is a really powerful motivating force. I had noted that Aquinas argued that for Christians, enduring wrong is a gift of love. And this concept of loving self-sacrifice that's inherent in each of the models of the courage that I identified is deeper than almost anything else that we have. Courage needs to be rooted in love. Rooted in a love for others, like the wider good of peace and uh, that maternal courage, but also rooted in self-love or self-esteem, because that self-esteem both flows from and feeds into our courageous action. If we examine ourselves, we know that when we've acted rightly, we see ourselves as more lovable and we esteem ourselves and that higher self-esteem invigorates our capacity for courageous action. So Aquinas tells us that, that courage depends upon the root passion of love, and I think he's right. Love must be the, su the supreme foundation for our courage. But there's a real need also for hope. Aquinas has also noted that courage likewise feeds upon hope which guards against the opposing passions of discouragement and despair. And for us, faced with the catastrophic effects of the climate breakdown, the collapse of our societies and the loss of so much that we love, that radical hope is a really necessary constituent of the courage that we need to have to carry on. I'd like to give the last word though, to an ethicist that I really like called Pianalta, because he concludes that for an ethic of moral courage to be of use, it will require a practical wisdom in understanding the right outlets and resources with which to take the moral stand. I translate that into 
moral courage needing discernment. So in summary, as we go into our breakout rooms, I'm suggesting that convictions, however environmentally attuned, won't cut it in addressing the environmental harm in the absence of lives of action. And meeting this challenge will require courage and that the traditional virtue of courage is just not enough to get us there. We do need the traditional discernment of a right balance between a lack of action arising out of fear or overcaution, and on the other hand, recklessness or fanaticism. And we do need to root our courage in hope and particularly love. But our contemporary model of courage should recognize the need for everyday perseverance, for endurance and self-sacrifice. And I think as individuals, we need to recognize the courage in that. So the question that you might want to think about in your breakout rooms is how do we acquire this virtue of courage? In the tradition of virtue ethics, taking good actions allows us to develop good practices. And virtue ethics proposes that people can develop character by putting virtues into action. So where might we recognize courage in our daily lives? And how can we apply this or build on it to encourage us to become more courageous people in an environmental context? Now, if that's a bit too personal, then you might want to think about how you can use practical wisdom in understanding the right outlets and resources with which to take the moral stand. <laughs>